What is a phreatic eruption? Phreatic eruptions are steam-driven explosions that occur when groundwater or surface water is heated by magma. Lava, hot rocks, or new volcanic deposits. The intense heat of such material can cause water to boil and turn to steam. Generating an explosion of steam, water, ash, blocks, and bombs. What is tephra? Tephra is the name given to all the material that erupts from a volcano, excluding lava. Tephra comes in all shapes and sizes, and is also referred to as pyroclastic material, fire particles. A pyroclast is material that is ejected during the explosive eruption of a volcano in the form of fragments. Pyroclastic material that is hot enough to fuse together before it falls to the ground is called welded or volcanic tuff. Geologists classify tephra according to size. The following lists the most common types of tephra, ash ash is material smaller than approximately a tenth of an inch. 2 mm, that is emitted from an erupting volcano. It can also contain lapilli, also called cinders or little stones, which is between 1 and 25 inches, 2 and 64 centimeters. In a large eruption, Ash can accumulate to a great thickness and spread out for thousands of miles. Usually in the direction of the prevailing winds. Block blocks are solid rock emitted from an erupting volcano. They can be anywhere from the size of a baseball to the size of a boulder as large as a house. Bombs Bombs are volcanic rocks that are still molten inside. They are shaped by their passage through the air. They form the brilliant arc seen in time-lapse photography of volcanic eruptions. Typically ranging from baseball to basketball size, they can be as large as a house. Bombs, and blocks, can be ejected from a volcano with initial velocities greater than 1,000 miles. 1,609 kilometers per hour, and can travel more than 3 miles, 5 kilometers. With some exploding and gushing molten rock when they eventually strike the ground. There are also certain types of bombs, including spindle bombs. Very fluid magma chunks that are streamlined as they fly through the air, and bread crust. Which is formed from viscous magma, creating rounded blobs that often have fractured surfaces. When are you most likely to see sprites and blue jets? The best chance to see one of these brief, strange lights is in the middle of the night. When you are near a strong thunderstorm and far away from the light pollution of a city or town. The storm should be more than 100 miles, 161 kilometers. Away, but no more than 300 miles, 482 kilometers, distant. Estimate the height of the storm clouds. Then multiply that by 8 to get the approximate altitude where the sprites and blue jets may appear.
Sprites may appear as reddish, orange, white, or even greenish flashes. Blue jets are even harder to see, but you are more likely to view them if the storm includes hail. What major gases do volcanoes emit? Volcanic gases contained within the magma, molten rock, are released as they reach the Earth's surface. Escaping at the major volcanic opening or from fissures and vents along the side of the volcano. The most prevalent gases are carbon dioxide, CO2, and hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Carbon dioxide is a dangerous gas, it is invisible and odorless, and can kill within minutes. One example in which volcanic gases proved dangerous involved the Dieng Volcano Complex, or Dieng Plateau, in Java, Indonesia. It consists of two volcanoes and over 20 craters and cones and is noted for its poisonous gas emissions at some craters. In 1979, at least 149 people were killed by poisonous gases as they fled eruptions at two of the craters, the Sinala and Sigludung. So, what is the modern theory of plate tectonics? The Earth's crust and lithosphere are broken into over a dozen thin, rigid shells. Or plates, that move around the planet over the plastic asthenosphere in the upper mantle. The interaction between these plates is called tectonics. From the Greek Tekken for Builder, plate tectonics describes the deformation of the Earth's surface as these plates collide. Pass by, go over, or go under each other. In other words, plate tectonics describes how these plates move, but not why. Overall, plate tectonics combines Wegener's theory of continental displacement or drift and Hess's discovery of seafloor spreading, sea below. The theory has truly revolutionized the study of the Earth's crust and deep interior. It allows scientists to study and understand the formation of such features as mountains, volcanoes, ocean basins, mid-ocean ridges, and deep-sea trenches, and to understand earthquakes and volcano formation. It also gives clues as to how the continents and oceans looked in the geologic past, and even how the climate and life forms evolved. Why is it important to understand geography in relation to the weather? There are a couple of reasons why geography is an important science for meteorologists to understand. One is that geographical features, such as mountains and coastlines, have an important influence on the weather. The other is that meteorologists interpret data from satellites, radar, and computer projections on various types of maps, and it is important for them to be able to visualize this data in three-dimensional space because the planet is not flat,
because of their unusual what was the yellow bubble lightning seen in 1991? And Bristol, England, two girls playing frisbee in 1991 encountered a bizarre yellow bubble of energy. It came in contact with them. And both received what felt like an electric shock that threw them to the ground. They lost their breaths for a moment, and upon recovering, ran home and told authorities. No one ever figured out what they saw, but it might have been an unusual form of ball lightning. Behavior In the past some people have associated them with spirits or other supernatural events. Ball lightning can wander in and out of rooms, usually vanishing harmlessly. But sometimes leaving holes in windows or doors. What is a fumarole? Volcanic gases escape from fumaroles, or vents, around volcanically active areas. They can occur along tiny cracks or long fissures in a volcano. In groups called clusters or fields, and on the surfaces of lava and pyroclastic flows. Fumaroles have been known to last for centuries. They can also disappear in a few weeks or months if their source cools quickly. For example, Yellowstone National Park and the Kilauea volcanoes have many fumaroles and associated deposits. Some have been there for years, while others have just recently appeared. What are the different types of lightning? Below are descriptions of the various forms that lightning can take. One normal lightning, also called streaked or forked lightning, travels from A. Cloud to ground, B. Cloud to air, C cloud to cloud, or D, in cloud. Two sheet lightning, a shapeless flash of lightning that covers a broad area. Three ribbon lightning, normal lightning blown sideways by the wind. In a way that makes it appear like parallel, successive strokes. Four beat or chain lightning, Lightning broken up into evenly spaced segments or beads. 5. Heat lightning, lightning seen along the horizon during hot weather that is a Reflection of lightning that occurred beyond the horizon in a distant thunderstorm. 6. Ball lightning, a rare form of lightning in which a persistent and moving luminous white or colored sphere is seen. Ball lightning can last from a few seconds to several minutes, and it travels at a walking pace. It usually ranges in size from 4 to 8 inches, 10 to 20 centimeters. But it has been observed at sizes between 2 inches to 6 feet, 5 to 183 centimeters. What is air glow? If you could remove all the illumination coming from city lights, the stars, and moon. And from aurora, the night sky would still have a faint, greenish glow to it. 
This is caused by oxygen atoms about 60 miles, 100 kilometers, high being excited by radiation from space. Other colors coming from different elements are also possible, but the green from oxygen predominates. This phenomenon is sometimes called the permanent aurora. Does thunder cause milk to go sour? No, this is an old wives tale. It may have stemmed from the fact that thunderstorms occur in times of heat and humidity. Which are conditions that, in themselves, can turn milk sour. What physical evidence shows that the continents move? Scientists have gathered plenty of evidence that shows the continents move over time. For example, the shape of the continents and their fit was determined by Sir Edward Bullard in 1965. He did not cite the usual continental shapes we see. But he measured the real edge of the continents, the continental slope, an area that shows a much better fit at the 6,560 foot 2,000 meter depth contour than at the shorelines of continents. Other scientists matched the continental geology on either side of an ocean. For example, the mountain belts of the Appalachians and the Caledonides are relatively similar geologically. As are the sedimentary basins of South Africa and Argentina. Another way to prove that continents move over time includes paleontology, in which similarities or differences of fossils on certain continents indicate a match. For example, there are similar Mesozoic era reptiles in North America and Europe. A time when scientists believe those two continents were joined together. Similar Carboniferous and Permian flora and fauna are found in South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and India. In contrast no doubt after the continents were well. Separated there is a wide diversity of organisms in the Cenozoic era. Where are aurorae seen? Aurorae are most prominent at high altitudes near the North and South Poles. They can also be seen sometimes at lower latitudes on clear nights. Far from city lights, every once in a while perhaps once every year or so aurorae can be seen as far south as the lower 48 states of the United States. Displays of aurorae can be amazingly beautiful, varying in color from whitish green to deep red and taking on forms like streamers, arcs, curtains, and shells. What is a thunderstorm? Thunderstorms are localized atmospheric phenomena that produce heavy rain. Thunder and lightning, and sometimes hail. They are formed in cumulonimbus clouds, big and bulbous, that rise many miles into the sky. 
most of the southeastern United States has over 40 days of thunderstorm activity each year. And there are about 100,000 thunderstorms across the country annually. How many active volcanoes are there? Currently, there are somewhere between 800 and 50 and 1,500 known active volcanoes on our planet. There are 63 active volcanoes in the United States, mostly in Alaska, Hawaii, and in the Pacific Northwest. At any given time, about 10 or 12 volcanoes are erupting planet-wide. Did volcanoes play a role in creating Earth's atmosphere? Scientists now believe that much of our planet's atmosphere was generated by carbon dioxide. Water vapor, nitrogen, argon, and methane spewing out of volcanoes. When life began to form as primitive plant cells. The carbon dioxide issued from volcanoes was absorbed by these plants and then released as oxygen. At first, the oxygen reacted with iron and other metals in the Earth's crust. Creating iron oxides that form the commonly seen reddish earth in the ground. Eventually, though, there was enough oxygen that it became part of the atmosphere. And breathable air was created. How do thunderstorms make our planet habitable? Thunderstorms, of course, usually bring rain or other precipitation with them. Which is needed for life on Earth. But other rainstorms can do this as well. What makes thunderstorms particularly unique and important is their role in heat convection. Thunderstorms move warm air from lower elevations to upper elevations. The difference in temperatures between ground level and the top of thunderstorm clouds can be as much as 200 degrees Fahrenheit 95 degrees Celsius. Causing this air and temperature circulation helps cool our planet by as much as 20 degrees Fahrenheit 9 to 10 degrees Celsius. Without thunderstorms, therefore, we would already be experiencing global warming. On a scale twice as bad as scientists are forecasting because of climate change. What are some cloud to space forms of lightning that are not considered to be true lightning? There are four types of electrical phenomena that have been observed that are not really lightning but still involve fascinating atmospheric displays called transient luminous events or TLEs, they are usually seen during storms. They are sometimes called cloud-to-space lightning, though they do not actually originate within clouds. The first scientific paper on these phenomena was published in 1886, but scientists were not very interested in the subject until more recently, as photographic images became increasingly available. 
one sprites, often reddish lights appearing above thunderstorms for very brief periods of time. Sprites look kind of like jellyfish, they have a blob of light on top and numerous tendrils descending downward. Sprites can shoot 55 to 60 miles, about 90 to 95 kilometers. Up into the atmosphere, reaching the ionosphere, and extend 100 miles, 161 kilometers, across. They are very difficult to see, and for that reason were not reliably recorded until the 1980s. Two blue jets, blue lightning that emerges from the tops of thunderstorm clouds at speeds of about 62 miles. 100 kilometers per hour. Meteorologists still do not fully understand what causes blue jets. Three elves, a short name for a very long winded description, elves are emissions of light and very low frequency. VLF, Perturbations from Electromagnetic Pulse, EMP, Sources Appearing as giant rings that expand up to 200 miles, 320 kilometers, in diameter. Elves exist in the upper atmosphere at elevations of 55 to 60 miles, 90 to 95 kilometers. Even more short-lived than sprites, they last about one one-thousandth of a second. Four tigers, first observed on January 20, 2003. This newest atmospheric light phenomenon has still not been adequately explained by scientists. Tiger stands for transient ionospheric glow emission in red and were first observed with the use of an infrared video camera over the Indian Ocean by Elon Ramon. An Israeli astronaut aboard the space shuttle Columbia, which later exploded, killing the crew. The tigers that Ramon observed occurred as bright flashes when there was no thunderstorm activity nearby. What is the connection between earthquakes and plate tectonics? Only the lithosphere has the strength and brittle behavior to fracture in an earthquake. And as lithospheric plate boundaries push, pull apart, or grind against each other, earthquakes occur. In 1969, scientists published the locations of all earthquakes that occurred from 1961 to 1967. They discovered most earthquakes. And volcanoes, too, they later learned, occurred in narrow belts around the world. Thus, it is now known that areas with frequent earthquakes and volcanoes help define the plate boundaries. How much volcanic activity occurs underwater? There is a huge amount of volcanic activity taking place underwater we just can't see it. Some geologists estimate that approximately 80% of all Earth's volcanic activity occurs on the ocean floor. What happened when M.T. St. Helens erupted? On the morning of May 18, 1980, a magnitude 5.1 earthquake struck beneath the M.T. 
St. Helens Volcano in Washington State. Later that day, the volcano exploded, initiating a massive avalanche that tore away. The northern slope of the mountain and created the largest landslide in recorded history. The conical volcano went from about 9,678 feet (2,950 meters) to 8,366 feet (2,550 meters) in height, releasing a giant plume of ash and gas high into the atmosphere. A lethal pyroclastic flow of hot steam, gas, and rock debris raced down the slope of the mountain. Traveling as fast as 684 miles, 1,100 kilometers, per hour. A fine ash dust was propelled into the upper atmosphere, stratosphere. At heights reaching up to 15 miles, 22 kilometers. Spreading to the east by the prevailing westerly winds and eventually reaching all over the world. In a short time, the ash blanketed central Washington, the prevailing winds carrying an estimated 540 million tons of ash across 22,007 square miles, 57,000 square kilometers, of the western United States. People in towns nearby, and some as far away as western Montana, were affected by the rain of ash. Car radiators were clogged, upper respiratory problems worsened. Air and ground travel were disrupted, and a thick coating of ash particles covered everything outside. Despite such impressive statistics, the MT St. Helens eruption did not disrupt climate on a worldwide scale. There are two reasons for this, one, the volcano did not release that much sulfur dioxide compared to some other major eruptions. And two, the eruption blew out the side of the mountain. Thus shooting debris at an angle and not as high into the atmosphere as might have otherwise happened. Who initially proposed the idea of moving continents? The idea of the continents moving around our planet was mentioned as early as 1587 by the Flemish mapmaker. With German origins, Abraham Ortelius, 1527-1598, in his work Thesaurus Geographicus. In 1620, Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, also mentioned the idea. Noting the fit of the coastlines on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. By the 1880s, many other scientists were mentioning the connection. For example, in 1885, Australian geologist Edward Seuss, 1831-1914, proposed that the southern continents had once been a huge land mass that he called Gondwanaland. But it was German scientist Alfred Wegener, 1880-1930, who first formally published the idea of continental displacement. Or drift in his 1915 book, The Origins of Continents and Oceans. He believed the continents were once joined together into one supercontinent, a place he named Pangaea. Also spelled Pangaea, meaning all land, that was surrounded by a superocean called Panthalassa. He also suggested that the massive continent divided about 200 million years ago. 
with Lor Asia moving to the north and Gondwana, or Gondwana land, to the south. Wegener based his ideas of continental motion on numerous observations. The continental distribution of fossil ferns called Glossopteres, from studies by Seuss, the discovery of coal in Antarctica by Sir Ernest Henry Shackleton. 1874 to 1922, similar glacial erosion seen in the tropical areas of India. South Africa, and Australia, the apparent fit of the South America and West African continental shorelines. And, although it may only be legend, by watching ice flows drifting on the sea. Although Wegener is now considered the man who started a revolution in geology. His ideas were hotly debated by scientists of his time. Not only was he a meteorologist in a community of geologists. But he could offer no logical mechanism for the movement of the land masses. It wasn't until the 1960s, long after his tragic death in Greenland. He died at the age of 50 while on a rescue mission, that Wegener was vindicated. By then, scientific measurements, observations, and technology had advanced enough to prove that. Indeed, the continents are moving around the planet on giant lithospheric plates. Wegener's theory of continental displacement was replaced by the new field of plate tectonics, which is the basis for modern geology. Can you see the aurora during the day? No, human eyes can't detect aurorae during the daytime. However, the aurorae are there, and satellites that can detect X-rays, such as the POSE, are able to monitor aurorae activity. What are the two forms of cloud-to-ground lightning? Cloud to ground, CG, strokes of lightning come in negative and positive forms. Negative CGS, which make up about 95% of all such lightning strokes, occur when the ground becomes positively charged. A positive CG does the opposite, and the ground becomes negatively charged. Positive CGS tend to have more power and longer strike time, thus. They are more likely to cause damage and are blamed for starting more forest fires. Who contributed to early work in plate tectonics? There were several key scientists who contributed to the study of plate tectonics as it became more favored in the late 1960s. One of the most popular scientists to discover evidence for plate tectonics was J. Tuzo Wilson. 1908-1993, by 1965, he described the origin of the San Andreas Fault, the large crack in the Earth's surface near San Francisco, California, as a transform fault, or strike slip, dash one of the major plate boundaries. In 1968, Xavier L. E. Pichon, 1937, participated in the definition of the overall plate. 
tectonics model and published the first model quantitatively describing the motion of six main plates at the Earth's surface. In 1973, he wrote the first textbook on the subject. Other geologists have made major contributions to the development of the plate tectonics theory. William Jason Morgan published a landmark paper in 1968 explaining the many tectonic plates and their movements, he also recognized the importance of mid-plate volcanic hotspots that create island chains such as the Hawaiian Islands. Walter Pittman III was instrumental in interpreting the pattern of marine magnetic anomalies detected around mid-ocean ridges. An indicator of active seafloor spreading and evidence of plate tectonics. And Lynn R. Sykes used seismology to refine plate tectonics. And he noted the connection between transform faults at the mid ocean ridges and plate motion. He also co authored Seismology and the New Global Tectonics in 1968 which relates how existing seismic data could be explained in terms of plate tectonics. What is the difference between the Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis? The Aurora Borealis is the name for aurorae that appear in the Northern Hemisphere. While the Aurora Australis appears in the Southern Hemisphere. Can volcanic eruptions affect the global climate? Most volcanic eruptions do not affect the global climate. Although larger ones can cause disruptions albeit for a relatively short period of time. Large eruptions tend to eject gases and dust high into the stratosphere. From there, prevailing winds carry the particles around the world sometimes with interesting results. For example, in 1815, M.T. Tombo wrought on the island of Sumbawa, near Java, Indonesia. Erupted, putting out a record amount of ash that briefly changed the world's climate. Huge amounts of volcanic dust rose high into the atmosphere, reaching around the globe. That year, and for some of the following year. Volcanic particles screened out some sunlight, causing the global temperatures to fall. In Europe and other parts of the Northern Hemisphere. Winter never seemed to end, with frosts occurring throughout the summer. Hence, 1816 is known as the year with no summer. Scientists used to believe that cooling of the atmosphere could result from volcanic eruptions because of the amount of ash that was thrown up into the air. Now they know, however, that most of these fine particulates return to the Earth within about six months. What actually has a greater effect is the sulfur dioxide, so too, that volcanoes produce. Sulfur dioxide reacts with water vapor. And the result is a long-lasting haze that blocks out a considerable amount of the sun's radiation. What are black smokers?
black smokers are actually deep ocean hydrothermal, hot water, vents, named after the dark. Soot like material ejected from chimney formations on the ocean floor. The material is actually superheated water, around 662 degrees Fahrenheit 350 degrees Celsius, with very high concentrations of dissolved. Minerals mostly sulfur bearing minerals or sulfides from lava on a mid ocean ridge volcano. As the hot water meets the cold ocean waters, the minerals precipitate out, settling out around the surrounding rock. Over time, the hollowed out chimneys grow taller as more minerals precipitate out. Black smokers tend to occur in volcanic vent fields that are typically tens of yards across. With fields ranging from pool table size. 43 square feet 4 square meters, to tennis court size, 8,288 square feet 770 square meters. For example, vent fields are found on the Juan de Fuca Ridge, a mid-ocean ridge in the Pacific Ocean. Many vents have been discovered since the first site was found in 1977 near the Galapagos Islands. In the small research submersible Alvin, and there are probably many more. But scientists have only explored a small portion of the Earth's mid-ocean ridges. Is Yellowstone actually a supervolcano? Yellowstone National Park is renowned for its scenic geysers and hot springs covering some 2,300 square miles, 3,800 square kilometers. The energy for all this hot water actually comes from volcanic energy below a plateau that is actually a giant caldera. Geologists estimate that this massive volcano last erupted about 640,000 years ago with an energy equal to 8. 000 Mount St. Helens eruptions. One can only imagine the destruction such an explosion would have wreaked. A nuclear winter would have ensued, acid rain would have fallen from the sky. And some scientists believe that the human race was driven almost to extinction at the time. Since the volcano is still active, it could happen again at almost any time. Some parts of Yellowstone have risen about 29 inches, 74 centimeters. Since measurements were first taken in 1923, which indicates a buildup of magma. Beneath the crust. It is only a matter of time before this energy is released. And Yellowstone is not the only such supervolcano. The last such eruption came from Tobot, Sumatra. About 70,000 to 75,000 years ago, and other, as yet undiscovered supervolcanoes might exist. Is Yellowstone actually a supervolcano? Yellowstone National Park is renowned for its scenic geysers and hot springs covering some 2,300 square miles, 3,800 square kilometers. The energy for all this hot water actually comes from volcanic energy below a plateau that is actually a giant caldera. 
geologists estimate that this massive volcano last erupted about 640,000 years ago with an energy equal to 8. 000 Mount St. Helens eruptions. One can only imagine the destruction such an explosion would have wreaked. A nuclear winter would have ensued, acid rain would have fallen from the sky. And some scientists believe that the human race was driven almost to extinction at the time. Since the volcano is still active, it could happen again at almost any time. Some parts of Yellowstone have risen about 29 inches, 74 centimeters. Since measurements were first taken in 1923, which indicates a buildup of magma. Beneath the crust. It is only a matter of time before this energy is released. And Yellowstone is not the only such supervolcano. The last such eruption came from Toba, Sumatra. About 70,000 to 75,000 years ago, and other, as yet undiscovered supervolcanoes might exist. What two volcanic eruptions had the biggest impacts on the climate in the 20th century? The eruption of El Shishan in southern Mexico, which lasted from March 29 through April 4, 1982, and the June 15, 1991, eruption of Mt. Pinatubo in the Philippines caused significant disruptions to the planet's climate. El Shishan shot about 7.75 million tons over 7 billion kilograms, of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. As well as some 24.25 million tons, 22 billion kilograms, of other dust and particles. Coincidentally, there was a strong El Nino building at the same time. While the El Nino effect worked to warm ocean waters, the El Shishan eruption was cooling the atmosphere. And the result was that the two effectively cancelled each other out. That summer, when temperatures should have increased because of El Nino. The average temperatures were actually fairly normal. During the winter of 1982 to 1983, though, temperatures in Europe, Siberia, and North America were higher than normal. And temperatures in the Middle East, China, Greenland, and Alaska were cooler. This was because the gases from El Shishan had caused an Arctic oscillation in the stratosphere. Changing Air Current Patterns When Mount Pinatubo erupted, it sent 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the sky. And estimates are that this resulted in an average worldwide temperature drop of 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit 0.8 degrees Celsius in 1992. The effects continued through 1993. As the haze produced by the extra sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere reflected the sun's rays. What two volcanic eruptions had the biggest impacts on the climate in the 20th century? The eruption of El Shishan in southern Mexico, which lasted from March 29 through April 4, 1982, and the June 15, 1991, eruption of Mt. Pinatubo in the Philippines caused significant disruptions to the planet's climate. 
El Shishan shot about 7.75 million tons, over 7 billion kilograms, of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. As well as some 24.25 million tons, 22 billion kilograms, of other dust and particles. Coincidentally, there was a strong El Nino building at the same time. While the El Nino effect worked to warm ocean waters, the El Shishan eruption was cooling the atmosphere. And the result was that the two effectively cancelled each other out. That summer, when temperatures should have increased because of El Nino. The average temperatures were actually fairly normal. During the winter of 1982 to 1983, though, temperatures in Europe, Siberia and North America were higher than normal. And temperatures in the Middle East, China, Greenland and Alaska were cooler. This was because the gases from El Shishan had caused an Arctic oscillation in the stratosphere. Changing Air Current Patterns When Mount Pinatubo erupted, it sent 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the sky. And estimates are that this resulted in an average worldwide temperature drop of 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit 0.8 degrees Celsius in 1992. The effects continued through 1993. As the haze produced by the extra sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere reflected the sun's rays. What is the Ring of Fire? There is a circular region that surrounds the Pacific Ocean where volcanic activity is particularly high. This is known as the Ring of Fire and includes coastal areas in Japan, Russia, Alaska, Canada. Oregon, Washington State, California, Mexico, Southeast Asia, and many South Pacific Islands. The ring stretches some 40,000 miles, 64,000 kilometers, and includes three-fourths of the planet's volcanoes. Among those are MT St. Helens and recently active volcanoes in Alaska, such as Mount Spur, which erupted in 1992, and MT. Redoubt, which erupted March 22, 2009, near Anchorage. What is the Ring of Fire? There is a circular region that surrounds the Pacific Ocean where volcanic activity is particularly high. This is known as the Ring of Fire and includes coastal areas in Japan, Russia, Alaska, Canada. Oregon, Washington State, California, Mexico, Southeast Asia, and many South Pacific Islands. The ring stretches some 40,000 miles. 64,000 kilometers and includes three-fourths of the planet's volcanoes. Among those are MT St. Helens and recently active volcanoes in Alaska, such as Mount Spur, which erupted in 1992, and MT Redoubt, which erupted March 22, 2009, near Anchorage. What is oceanography? Oceanography is the study of the world's oceans. 
including the waters and everything in them, animals, plants, and minerals. Oceanographers study the physics, chemistry, biology, and geology of the seas. Oceanography is important to understand in relation to meteorology for many reasons. For example, the oceans have a lot to do with heat absorption, distribution, and reflection. As well as with the water cycle and with levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, among other influences. What is oceanography? Oceanography is the study of the world's oceans. Including the waters and everything in them, animals, plants, and minerals. Oceanographers study the physics, chemistry, biology, and geology of the seas. Oceanography is important to understand in relation to meteorology for many reasons. For example, the oceans have a lot to do with heat absorption, distribution, and reflection. As well as with the water cycle and with levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, among other influences. How much water is there on Earth? Including all the world's oceans, lakes, rivers, as well as all the water contained in the Earth's soils. In the atmosphere, and in icebergs and other frozen forms. Scientists estimate that there is 3.7 x 1014 gallons, 1 1.4 x 1015 liters, of water on the planet. How much water is there on Earth? Including all the world's oceans, lakes, rivers, as well as all the water contained in the Earth's soils. In the atmosphere, and in icebergs and other frozen forms. Scientists estimate that there is 3.7 x 1014 gallons, 1 1.4 x 1015 liters, of water on the planet. How much water is in the world's oceans? Earth is about 70% covered by oceans and seas. And about 97% of the world's total water is contained in the oceans. 2% of this water is in the form of ice. How much water is in the world's oceans? Earth is about 70% covered by oceans and seas. And about 97% of the world's total water is contained in the oceans. 2% of this water is in the form of ice. What is a hydrometer? A 
A hydrometer measures the specific gravity of a liquid. It is used to determine the density of a fluid compared to the density of pure water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit 15.5 degrees Celsius. This can be handy when seeking a reading for the salinity of water. Such as when taking samples of sea water. What is a hydrometer? A hydrometer measures the specific gravity of a liquid. It is used to determine the density of a fluid compared to the density of pure water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit 15.5 degrees Celsius. This can be handy when seeking a reading for the salinity of water. Such as when taking samples of sea water. How much water evaporates from the world's oceans? Incredibly, over 1.32 x 1,017 gallons, 500,000 cubic kilometers of water evaporate from the oceans each year. Fortunately, that water is replenished by 1. 19 x 1,017 gallons, 450,000 cubic kilometers of rain and snowfall as well as waters draining into the oceans and seas from rivers and streams. How much water evaporates from the world's oceans? Incredibly, over 1.32 x 1,017 gallons, 500,000 cubic kilometers of water evaporate from the oceans each year. Fortunately, that water is replenished by 1. 19 x 1,017 gallons, 450,000 cubic kilometers of rain and snowfall as well as waters draining into the oceans and seas from rivers and streams. How much drinkable fresh water is there on Earth? Only 2.59% of all the water on our planet is fresh water. However, much of that water is now polluted, and hydrologists and environmentalists estimate that only about 1% of the planet's total water supply is clean enough to drink. How much drinkable fresh water is there on Earth? Only 2.59% of all the water on our planet is fresh water. However, much of that water is now polluted, and hydrologists and environmentalists estimate that only about 1% of the planet's total water supply is clean enough to drink. What is Arctic Sea Smoke? When extremely cold air blows over Arctic ice packs. 
The warmer sea water beneath causes fog to form when it comes into contact with the colder air. As the fog rises, it may appear to be smoke plumes. What is Arctic Sea Smoke? When extremely cold air blows over Arctic ice packs. The warmer sea water beneath causes fog to form when it comes into contact with the colder air. As the fog rises, it may appear to be smoke plumes. What are growlers? Growlers are pieces of floating ice that have broken off from an iceberg. What are growlers? Growlers are pieces of floating ice that have broken off from an iceberg. Which freezes more quickly cold or hot water? An old wives tale that still circulates in American homes is that. If you wish to freeze ice quickly in an ice tray, put hot tap water in it and then put it in the freezer. Of course, Many homes have automatic ice dispensers in their refrigerators. So this tale is beginning to die out somewhat. Let's dispel the myth now, however, and say that, no, hot water will not freeze faster than cold. However, what does work is boiling the water, then allowing it to cool down to a tepid temperature. Boiling the water removes air bubbles in the water. Increasing thermal conductivity, and allowing the water to freeze more quickly. Of course, the time wasted boiling the water and then allowing it to cool would have been better spent by simply putting lukewarm water in the freezer in the first place. Not to mention that it would be more energy efficient not to boil the water. Which freezes more quickly cold or hot water? An old wives tale that still circulates in American homes is that. If you wish to freeze ice quickly in an ice tray, put hot tap water in it and then put it in the freezer. Of course, many homes have automatic ice dispensers in their refrigerators. So this tale is beginning to die out somewhat. Let's dispel the myth now, however, and say that, no, hot water will not freeze faster than cold. However, what does work is boiling the water, then allowing it to cool down to a tepid temperature. Boiling the water removes air bubbles in the water. Increasing thermal conductivity, and allowing the water to freeze more quickly. Of course, the time wasted boiling the water and then allowing it to cool would have been better spent by simply putting lukewarm water in the freezer in the first place. Not to mention that it would be more energy efficient not to boil the water.
What is sea flower spreading? Sea flower spreading is one of the processes that helps move the lithospheric plates around the world. The process is slow but continuous, like a hot, bubbling stew on the stove. The even hotter asthenospheric mantle rises to the surface and spreads laterally. Transporting oceans and continents as if they were on a slow conveyor belt. This area is usually called a mid-ocean ridge, such as the mid-Atlantic ridge system in the Atlantic Ocean. The newly created lithosphere eventually cools as it gets farther from the spreading center. This is why the oceanic lithosphere is youngest at the mid-ocene ridges and gets progressively older farther away. As it cools, it becomes more dense. Because of this, it rides lower in the underlying asthenosphere. Which is why the oceans are deepest away from the spreading centers and more shallow at the mid-ocean ridges. After thousands to millions of years, the cooled area reaches another plate boundary. Either subducting, colliding, or rubbing past another plate. If part of the plate subducts, it will eventually be heated and recycled back into the mantle. Rising again in millions of years at another or the same spreading center. What is an indoor thunderstorm? When the humidity is very low inside a building, static electricity can easily build up as people walk across carpeting. Dragging their feet, and then touch a piece of furniture, a doorknob, or some other object. When this happens, a discharge of about 40. 000 volts can occur in even a small spark jumping from your fingertips. Running a humidifier inside the home during winter can usually keep these indoor thunderstorms. A rather exaggerated term, at bay. What is a rain shadow? When the moisture in the air is squeezed out by orographic precipitation. There's not much left for the other side of the mountains. The dry side of the mountains experiences a rain shadow effect. What is a derecho? Pronounced derecho, this is large, long-lived thunderstorm characterized by strong wind downbursts. What are the requirements for a storm to be considered a severe thunderstorm? In order for it to be categorized as severe a thunderstorm must have winds exceeding 58 miles. 93 kilometers per hour and slash or have tornadoes or large hail or be likely to generate tornadoes or large hail. The National Weather Service issues thunderstorm warnings. Based on the potential for storms to become severe.
How much water is there on Earth? Including all the world's oceans, lakes, rivers, as well as all the water contained in the Earth's soils. In the atmosphere, and in icebergs and other frozen forms. Scientists estimate that there is 3.7 x 1014 gallons, 1 1.4 x 1015 liters, of water on the planet. How do meteorologists classify thunderstorms? There are several classifications of thunderstorms, single cell the smallest type of storm system. Single cell storms form from a convective loop of warm updrafts and cool down drafts. They usually form the weakest and briefest rainstorms. Multicell A storm system formed from two or more storm cells. Supercell the largest and most dangerous type of storm system. And one which is often associated with tornadoes. Supercells develop in massive cumulonimbus storm clouds and are characterized by nearly vertical. Unsuppressed updrafts and precipitation falling at a nearly horizontal angle. Because the air currents are not suppressed, they tend to continue building in strength for hours. Squall line A line of cumulonimbus storm clouds reaching up to 600 miles, 965 kilometers, long. How much water is in the world's oceans? Earth is about 70% covered by oceans and seas. And about 97% of the world's total water is contained in the oceans. 2% of this water is in the form of ice. What two volcanic eruptions had the biggest impacts on the climate in the 20th century? The eruption of El Shishan in southern Mexico, which lasted from March 29 through April 4, 1982, and the June 15, 1991, eruption of MT. Pinatubo in the Philippines caused significant disruptions to the planet's climate. El Shishan shot about 7.75 million tons, over 7 billion kilograms, of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. As well as some 24.25 million tons, 22 billion kilograms, of other dust and particles. Coincidentally, there was a strong El Nino building at the same time. While the El Nino effect worked to warm ocean waters, the El Shishan eruption was cooling the atmosphere. And the result was that the two effectively cancelled each other out. That summer, when temperatures should have increased because of El Nino, the average temperatures were actually fairly normal. During the winter of 1982 to 1983, though, temperatures in Europe, Siberia and North America were higher than normal. And temperatures in the Middle East, China, Greenland and Alaska were cooler. 
This was because the gases from El Shishan had caused an arctic oscillation in the stratosphere. Changing Air Current Patterns When Mount Pinatubo erupted, it sent 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the sky. And estimates are that this resulted in an average worldwide temperature drop of 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit 0.8 degrees Celsius in 1992. The effects continued through 1993. As the haze produced by the extra sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere reflected the sun's rays. What is the speed of sound? The speed of sound can vary, depending on air pressure and, more importantly, temperature. The conventionally accepted speed, which is useful for estimating the distance to a lightning stroke, is about one mile for every five seconds. More precisely, sound travels at 740 miles per hour, 1,191 kilometers per hour. At one atmosphere pressure when the temperature is 32 degrees Fahrenheit 0 degrees Celsius. Sound travels faster through water and many other media that are denser than air. In general, because the temperature of the air cools as altitude increases. Sound is refracted upwards and away from people on the ground. Thus, measurable sound decreases the farther away one is from the source. On the other hand, the stratospheric layer of the atmosphere increases. In temperature as altitude increases, thus refracting sound downward. What did the continents look like in the past? Because of the movement of the lithospheric plates, the continent's positions have changed over time. For example, some scientists believe that about 700 million years ago a huge continent called Rodinia formed around the equator, about 500 million years ago. The continent broke apart, forming Laurasia, today's North America and Eurasia, and Gondwana or Gondwana land, today's South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and India. Then, about 250 million years ago, the continents were once again together in one massive supercontinent called Pangaea, or Pangaea, translated as all land. Eventually, the huge continent began to break up, forming Laurasia and Gondwana again. What is oceanography? Oceanography is the study of the world's oceans including the waters and everything in them, animals, plants, and minerals. Oceanographers study the physics, chemistry, biology, and geology of the seas. Oceanography is important to understand in relation to meteorology for many reasons. For example, the oceans have a lot to do with heat absorption, distribution, and reflection as well as with the water cycle and with levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, among other influences.
Why is Greenland called green when it is mostly covered in ice? When Scandinavian explorers first discovered the large island north of Iceland in the late 10th century, they wished to attract more settlers to the land, and so they named it Greenland, according to some sources. Another explanation is that the island was actually named Gruntland. The word Grunt meaning shallow bay. The name was later mistranslated on maps, becoming Greenland. While much of the island is inhospitably covered by a huge glacier, the southern coastline does actually have vegetation and has served as good fishing ground. The Little Ice Age of the 15th century decimated the Viking settlements, however. What is an acoustic shadow? An acoustic shadow is kind of like a mirage, only involving sound instead of light. Differences in temperatures at varying atmospheric layers causes sound waves to refract or bend. Also wind shears and the absorption of sound on soft surfaces can contribute to the effect. The result can be that sounds coming from a particular source might not be heard by someone standing fairly close by, while other people located farther away. But in a direction where sounds are being refracted, can hear the sound. A famous example the consequences of acoustic shadow is often cited from the U.S. Civil War. During the 1862 Battle of Seven Pines in Richmond, Virginia, Confederate General Joseph Johnston told his commanders that upon hearing gunfire from soldiers being led under Major General D.H. Hill, he would order Brigadier General W.H.C. Whiting to send in an attack on the Union's flank. However, because of acoustic shadow, Johnston was unable to hear the battle noise and the flank attack was not sent in when it was needed. The Confederates subsequently lost the battle. Which continents have the highest and lowest average elevations on the planet? Antarctica has the highest average elevation, 7,546 feet 2,300 meters above sea level. Much of which is due to the permanent glacial ice. Australia has the lowest average, 984 feet 300 meters above sea level. 